Thanks to you, there will be no illithid empire, no death god's tyranny. You have earned your place amongst the legends of the Sword Coast. You are the saviors of Baldur's In this video, I'll be going over what I think makes a good party composition in Baldur's Gate 3, as well as detailing my best party composition through each act, breaking down their respective roles and the allocation of gear pieces throughout. Before we get into the comp, what actually makes a good party? There are differing and conflicting opinions on the elements that comprise a good party comp in Baldur's Gate. Specifically, there seems to be a discourse on the points of diminishing returns and redundancy. When is the inclusion of something too much and when is it outright useless? I believe in the following four core tenets of creating an optimal party. The best party comps are those that satisfy the following. 1. Your party comp has little to no competition for gear pieces. You want each of your party members or builds to operate at their respective maximum, and this requires satisfying their respective best and slot gear pieces. If two or more party members want the same piece or pieces of gear, you incur a gear bottleneck. As such, you should try and build a party comp of builds that want different pieces of gear to operate at maximum efficiency. Number 2. Your party comp has diverse damage profiles to fulfill the differing demands of each combat. Certain fights require a good AoE profile to deal damage to many targets, other fights demand funnel damage on priority targets, and some fights will need both. You should diversify your party comp to cover all potential bases in a fight, or you run the risk of leaving your party vulnerable to certain types of fights. Too much AoE damage, and you become vulnerable to priority targets and bosses. Too much single target, and you become vulnerable to being overrun by mobs of lesser enemies. Number 3. Your party comp has a versatile utility toolkit of in-combat crowd control and out-of-combat skill checks. Damage output and combat is not the entirety of Baldur's Gate, and the inclusion of utility pieces such as guidance can be the difference between a successful and failed dice check. Each class brings something different. Clerics bring guidance, sorcerers can twin cast haste, bards grant an extra short rest, Wizards can influence enemy saving throws. Ideally, you want to have as many important utility pieces as realistically possible. Your thought process should be something like this. Do I have a way to enhance my dice rolls out of combat? Do I have a way to increase movement speed? Do I have ways of dealing with charms, poisons, or paralysis? Do I have party members that are proficient in wisdom saving throws? What about intelligence? Do I have someone with high charisma who is my designated dialogue character? The list goes on until you can answer yes, to as many questions as possible without compromising the other core tenets of building a party. And finally, number four, dedicated tanks and healers are a complete myth. Dedicating an entire party member to tanking or healing is an inefficient and redundant way to build a party. The problem isn't that healing is useless, but that it is action inefficient. Combat in Baldur's Gate is all about action economy, and to have lucrative turns, you need to spend your actions efficiently, especially more so than your enemy. Not only does healing get outscaled by damage in most instances, but in almost all instances, spending your action on killing or incapacitating an enemy is significantly more useful. Especially with the inclusion of healing pots, a dedicated healer would have to spend an entire action on healing the party in a game where every party member can spend a bonus action for an equal or greater heal on themselves. In building a party, the best defense is a good offense. Thank you.
moving on to the four builds that make up the party. As a quick note, for all but one of these builds, I have a build guide linked in the description and that you can click on the screen right now that you can check out for a detailed step-by-step -step guide on leveling, spell selection, and gear by act. I will not be doing leveling breakdowns in this video as I already have videos dedicated to a more thorough explanation of the leveling process for each build. Starting off with our party face, we have the Dark Urge as the Sorlock, rocking a 4 Sorcerer, 2 Warlock, 3 Rogue, and 3 Fighter Split. I'm running the Dark Urge as my Tav almost entirely for the cape that you get in Act 1, so if you want to just run a regular old Tav, feel free to do so. We choose the Sorlock as our face character because it has the most efficient use of Charisma as it directly scales their Eldritch Blast damage. It edges out other Charisma classes like Bard or Paladin because it wants to invest into Charisma to scale their damage output anyway, unlike Bard or Paladin which have indirect uses for Charisma. Since your face character is going to be the one to engage in dialogue, and therefore wants Charisma the most, it felt like a no-brainer to choose a class that wants an investment into Charisma regardless. The Sorlock has a strong AoE profile due to the multiple beams of Eldritch Blast that can be fired multiple times a turn, but it really excels at single target damage and melting bosses or priority targets, capable of dealing up to 600 damage per round. It has pretty middle-of-the-road utility, only really being relevant in the early game when we take 5 levels of Warlock to get Hunger of Hadar. Once you reach the mid to late game and start pathing into Sorcerer, Rogue, and Fighter, it essentially loses all group utility in exchange for just a bunch of damage. As I just mentioned, it's strong in the early game, mostly due to Hunger of Hadar from taking the first 5 levels into Warlock. Next up we have the Tempest Wizard, which is a 2 Tempest Cleric 10 Evocation Wizard split. I do not have a guide for this build yet, so I'll cover it a little more thoroughly than the other classes. For this build you can assign it to Gale as it's on his brand, but realistically the race or companion doesn't matter, so you can give it to whoever is available. The Tempest Wizard is a late game jack of all trades. It has massive AoE potential with the combination of inducing the wet condition on enemies, to double the damage it deals from Lightning Bolt and Chain Lightning, which you can guarantee to deal maximum damage with the Destructive Wrath ability from Tempest Cleric, as well as generally devastating AoE spells like Fireball or Ice Storm. It has strong single target damage thanks to upcasting Magic Missiles or the Artistry of War Scroll in Act 3. It has excellent utility, whether in combat by creating hazardous surfaces or incapacitating enemies with whole person or out of combat with the best cantrip in the game in Guidance. Really its only shortcoming is its early game strength which is restricted by your limited access to spell slots and higher level spells, otherwise it's in contention for the best build in the party. If the Sorlock is responsible for boss damage, the Tempest Wizard guarantees the death of everything else. Next we have the Gloomstalker Ranger, which boasts a 5 Ranger, 4 Rogue, and 3 Fighter split. I assign it to Astarian as his happy buff in the early game does wonders in offsetting the Sharpshooter penalty, and his Ascension buff in Act 3 skyrockets his damage to just an unreasonable level, adding 1d10 Necrotic to each weapon attack. What can I say about this build that hasn't already been said? In my mind, it's perhaps the most prolific damage dealer in the game, easily capable of soloing honor mode by itself. Insane AoE with the arrow of many targets, insane single target with the arrows of slaying, comes online immediately at level 3 whether you choose to start Assassin or Gloomstalker. The only thing it doesn't excel at is group utility, but sometimes the best utility is damage anyway. Finally, we have the Bardadin, a 10 Swords Bard, 2 Vengeance Paladin split. You can assign it to any of the melee companions in Karlak, Lazel, or Minthara. The Bardadin is in part responsible for enabling the Gloomstalker by wearing the Ballas armor to radiate piercing vulnerability to enemies, which it also benefits from being that it dual wields daggers. It has relatively lacking AoE, only being able to cleave a few times per short rest, but makes up for it in spades with its excellent single target damage from the Ballas armor piercing vulnerability and divine smiting. A bard always has great group utility bringing a third short rest, bardic inspirations, and two of any of the most impactful spells in the game by virtue of their magical secrets. It also holds its own in the early game, being our only party member that's able to attack with a bonus action until Act 2. In a way, aside from their great damage, the Bardadin is the glue that synergizes the group together, enabling both your Sorlock with dialogue checks and the Gloomstalker with damage enhancement.
For the gearing section, I'm gonna go over both how I've distributed gear amongst my party and the game state nearing the end of each act. I'll skim over who wears what and why, as well as quickly break down the builds, showing how they've been leveled in each act. So nearing the end of Act 1, I've managed to reach level 7. I think you can reach level 8 before Act 2 if you get really granular with your leveling, but level 7 feels like a comfortable and realistic expectation for Act 1. Starting off with our party face, we have the Sorlock, who is currently a 2 Warlock 5 Sorcerer split. His first feat was spent on an ability improvement of plus 2 to Charisma, and the Hag's Hair was given to him for Charisma, rounding his Charisma up to 20. In terms of Elixir, I always try to have a Bloodless Elixir going on this character, otherwise nothing else is really too important. Moving on to his gear, we have the Warped Headband of Intellect from the Ogre in the Blighted Village, just because my intelligence was an 8 before. The Protecty Sparks Wall from Grimforge for his armor, as we'll always have Lightning Chargers from our staff, and therefore plus 1 to our armor class and saving throws. The Daredevil Gloves from the Gith Trader in the Kresh for a melee toggle for our Eldritch Blast. The Boots of Genial Striding for a, just lack of a better boot in Act 1. The Amulet of Misty Step from Priestess Guts Room for a free Misty Step. The Whispering Promise Ring sold by Volo for an on-demand bless. The Strange Conduit Ring from the Inquisitor, as you should almost always be focusing on an active Hex. Of course, the Spell Sparkler, a quest reward from saving Counselor Floric in Joaquin's Rest, and any old shield just for the plus 2 AC. All of my characters, other than the Gloomstalker, are going to have two hand crossbows equipped to weaponize their bonus action, as most classes don't have a way to deal damage with their bonus action. Next up is Astarian as the Gloomstalker. Currently he's a 5 ranger 2 rogue split. His first feat is Sharpshooter. As I, as I mentioned in my Gloomstalker video, I believe in taking Sharpshooter this early and I've had no issues with accuracy personally. I always try to have him on a Bloodlust Elixir as well. It's even more valuable on him, so if you have very few, prioritize giving to him first and foremost. For his gear, we have the Diadem of Arcane Synergy from the Inquisitor. He'll be inflicting conditions constantly with the Illithid Power Ability Drain. So his Wisdom modifier will always be added to his weapon attacks. The Deathstalker Mantle that you get from playing the Dark Urge. Again, by far the best recipient for this item, as the advantage you get from turning invisible essentially offsets the Sharpshooter penalty. The Graceful Cloth from Lady Esther for a plus 2 to his dexterity. The armor class is a bit low, but I think it's worth the addition to our hit chance. The Gloves of Archery sold by Grat the Traitor in the Goblin Camp for just a flat plus 2 damage on our weapon attacks. The Boots of Stormy Clamor sold by Omelum in the Mykonic Colony. Again, he'll always inflict the condition by virtue of the Illithid ability. The Broodmother's Revenge dropped by Kaga for an on-heal poison. The Caustic Band sold by Dareth Bonecloak in the Mykonic Colony for another source of flat damage increase. And the Smuggler's Ring, which you can find on a skeleton near where you first find Karlak for a decent bonus to stealth and sleight of hand. For his weapon we have the Club of Hill Giant Strength from the Arcane Tower to set his strength to 19 to increase the damage done by the Titan String Bow which you can buy off of the Xantarim below Joaquin's Rest. For his offhand, just like the Sorlock, any old shield for the increase to armor class. Our third companion is Shadowheart on the Bardadin. This could also be Lazel or Karlak or eventually Minthara. If you prefer those characters, they work better anyway. She's currently a 6 Swords Bard, 1 Vengeance Paladin split, with her first feat being Savage Attacker to maximize her melee damage. I always have my Bardadin on a Elixir of Hill Giant Strength because finesse weapons scale with whatever is higher between your dexterity and your strength, and these elixirs help a lot with hit chance. For her gear, we have the Haste Helm from the Blighted Village for movement speed the Adamantine Scale Mail from Grimforge, the Wondrous Gloves dropped by the Mimic Chests in Grimforge for armor class and an extra charge of Bardic Inspiration, the Disintegrating Nightwalkers dropped by Nier in the Grimforge for Freedom of Movement and Misty Step, the Periapt of Wound Closure sold by Lady Esther in the Mountain Pass, the Ring of Protection which is a quest reward from Mole for stealing the Druid Idol, Crusher's Ring from Crusher the Goblin for more movement speed, the Short Sword of First Blood dropped by a Dead Deep Gnome near the Underdark Beach, and the Knife of the Undermountain King sold by the Gith Vendor in the Kresh. Finally, we have Gale on the Tempest Wizard build. I don't have a build guide for this yet, so I'll take this time to delve a little deeper into this build. So the Tempest Wizard aims to eventually be a 10 Evocation Wizard 2 Tempest Cleric caster. I start his leveling process by first taking the two levels into Tempest Cleric for armor proficiencies and an early source of guidance. 
and because your spellcasting modifier is based on the most recent class you've added to your build. Since this is mostly going to be a wizard, and we're only taking Cleric for Destructive Wrath, we want our spellcasting modifier to be our intelligence, and therefore want to add wizard explicitly after we add Cleric. So by Act 1, this build is a 2 Tempest Cleric start and a 5 Evocation Wizard split, starting with 16 Dexterity and 16 Intelligence. His first feat being an ability improvement of plus 2 to Intelligence. You sustain yourself in the early game with spells like Chromatic Orb, Scorching Ray, and Magic Missiles until you gain access to 3rd level spell slots in which you can hunt vendors for a scroll of lightning bolt and learn it through the scroll, finally having access to that combo of rain plus destructive wrath plus lightning bolt. Generally you want to abuse this strategy as much as possible, so even before you get lightning bolt or when you're out of 3rd level spell slots to cast lightning bolt, you can still set it up with things like rain plus chromatic orb for lightning or rain plus glyph of warding for lightning. For gear, we have the Circlet of Blasting sold by Blurg in the Mycanid Colony for a free Scorching Ray, the Adamantine Splint Armor from Grimforge, the Gloves of Belligerent Skies from the Crash, the Boots of Speed, which you can get from the Mycanid Colony, Psychic Spark, also sold by Blurg for an enhancement to your magic missiles, the Spark Swell for resistance to lightning, the Ring of Absolute Force from Grimforge, which works in tandem with the Thunder Damage from Falar Aluv's Shriek ability. The Defender Flail sold by the Gith Vendor in the Crush for a flat 1 point reduction of incoming damage. And yet again, just any old shield for armor class. For this build in particular, I do need to skim over certain alternatives really quickly. Now, more than alternatives, these are pieces of gear that I use for their abilities, and then I switch back to the flail anyway. So for our temporary alternatives, we have Falar Aluv for either the Shriek or Sing ability, the Blood of Lathander for the free Sunbeam, the Staff of Arcane Blessing for the free Empowered Bless, Melf's First Staff, which actually is a legitimate alternative for the flail, and finally the Pearl of Power Amulet from the Mykonid Colony, which replenishes up to a 3rd level spell slot, which for this build will mean a refunded lightning bolt. Moving on to our Act 2, Game State and Gearing. In the interest of time, I'm only going to talk about the changes made to each character's gear setup. So if there's a piece of gear that I don't talk about, it's because I'm just wearing the same thing as the last act. First, let's quickly break down our character sheet. I'm nearing the end of Act 2, where I've managed to reach level 9. Again, I think you can finish this act on level 10, but I think now is a good time to check in for game state, as you can get almost all of the gear pieces I'm about to show immediately upon reaching the second act. All that's left outstanding at this point in the game is fighting Ketherick, so no substantial will be made to gear setup anyway. So the class breakdowns are as follows. Our Sorlock continues taking levels into Sorcerer, landing it at a 2 Wizard 7 Sorcerer split, shifting the prioritization of using spell slots on sorcery points for quickened Eldritch Blasts. No second feat is taken. Our Bardadin gets their second level of Paladin, unlocking their smites. Now being able to smite with their action and bonus action, again no second feat is taken. The Ranger is pretty much finished, now having both the Gloomstalker and Assassin subclasses active, which are all you really need anyway to fully realize the extent of this build's capacity. The Ranger does get a second feat, which I use on an ability improvement for plus 2 into dexterity for both armor class and hit chance. Finally, the Tempest Wizard simply continues taking levels into Wizard, all the way to Wizard level 10. No second feat is taken, but higher level spell slots are unlocked and higher level spells can be learned through scrolls. Now to quickly go over the changes in gearing. For our Sorlock, we switch our helmet to the Fistbreaker Helm sold by Lantarv in Moonrise Towers for a bonus to our initiative. We get a cape in the Thunderskin Cloak sold by Arage, the Drow Merchant in Moonrise Towers. This character will now be our de facto reverberation applier, so it makes sense for him to have this cloak. We switch the Potent Robe, which you get from Alfira after saving the Tieflings from Moonrise, the quintessential piece necessary for the Sorlock. As I mentioned earlier about the reverberation, we take the Boots of Stormy Clamor previously on our Ranger. Continuing our application of reverberation, we have the Spine Shutter Amulet that you get from the Mimic Chest next to Ketherick's room. The Risky Ring sold by Araj. This was a difficult decision to make, being that really all characters want to attack with advantage. But since your Ranger will now always have advantage on all attack rolls in the first turn, your Bardadin will be using Strength Elixirs, and your Wizard forces saving throw rolls rather than attack rolls, I think it's best suited for the Sorlock. 
Finally, for the rings, we have the Callus Glow Ring from the vault next to Balthazar in the Gauntlet of Shar. Remember to have a party member illuminated by light at all times. We switch our shield over to the Sentinel Shield sold by Lantar for even more initiative. This is probably the best shield in the game, by the way, just as a quick note. And then for our bows, since we want to be spending our bonus actions now on quicken spells and not hand crossbow shots, we'll switch over to the Darkfire short bow sold by Damon at Last Light Inn, mainly for the resistances and the free haste. For our Barded Inn, we start with the Dark Justicier helmet from the Gauntlet of Shar, the Cloak of Protection sold by Quartermaster Tali at Last Light Inn for armor class. We're stacking as much armor class as possible on this character as they're our only melee character and we'll be receiving the brunt of incoming damage. The Dwarven Splint Mail sold by Lantarv after you pass an insight check while speaking with Disciples Rel. It's really important you pass that check otherwise you won't have access to this armory where this piece is. So remember to precast things like Guidance and or Enhance Ability before talking to Disciples Rel for the first time. Finally, for our weapons, we can switch to the Render of Mind and Body, sold by Lantarv, but since we don't have a consistent way of gaining advantage with this character, this is of lesser priority. And then finally, we have the Hellfire Hand Crossbow, dropped by Your Gear for a stronger ranged alternative. Very little is changed for the Ranger. Most of its strength in this act will come from getting the Assassin subclass rather than upgrades to gear pieces, but there are a few minor tweaks to their setup. We change the gloves of archery to the flawed Helldusk gloves that you get from Damon for more damage output. The evasive shoes sold by Mattis to help with their alarmingly low armor class, even though I don't think it's necessarily that threatening being how much damage this build does. Now we'll give the Ranger the Strange Conduit Ring, previously equipped by the Sorlock, because the Sorlock doesn't want to use their bonus action on Hex. You can satisfy the concentration requirement on this character with something really simple like a scroll of protection from good and evil or detect thoughts. Finally, you can switch his shield to the Iron Bandit shield that you find right next to Lantarv for more armor class. Wrapping up Act 2, we have our Tempest Wizard, starting with the Flawed Helldusk Helmet, again from Damon, the Flesh Melter Cloak from the Morgue for Retaliation. I found out just this playthrough that Lantarv can sell multiple copies of the Dwarven Splint Mail, so yeah, why not? Uh, honestly, you should give this armor to as many companions with heavy armor proficiency as possible. It's really that good, especially for Act 2. We'll give him the Whispering Promise Ring that the Sorlock previously wore. Many of the remaining rings in the game are just really underwhelming. For the weapon, I really like having the Blood of Lathander equipped for Act 2, as the Lathander's Light ability blinds fiends and undead, which make up almost the entirety of this act. Finally, we have the Nair Misser sold by Roa in Moonrise Towers, as we have some pre-existing synergies for our magic missiles. And finally, the end state of the best party composition in Baldur's Gate 3. The gearing for Act 3 will identically follow the individual guides I have for each build, with the only difference being the distribution of gear pieces that are overlapping across build guides. I'm recording this section pretty early in Act 3, despite having killed a few of the endgame bosses in Saravok, Orin, and Kazador, there were a lot of pieces that I rushed to as soon as reaching Act 3 that you can get pretty early on without engaging in any combat. So I think it's a happy medium between relatively early and late Act 3. If you are missing any of the pieces that I have, refer to the respective build guide that have a comprehensive list of alternatives that are not overlapping with each other. Starting off with our character sheet, we have the final breakdown of the finished builds at level 12. Our Sorlock is a 2 Great Old One Warlock, 3 Thief Rogue, 4 Draconic Sorcerer, and 3 Champion Fighter Split. This may seem confusing, but it's just the second variant of the Sorlock I built on my guide. The levels of Rogue are for extra bonus actions to spend on Eldritch Blasts, and the levels into Fighter is just for Action Surge for more one turn damage potential. Our Bardedon finishes off at a 10 Swords Bard to Vengeance Paladin Split. The investment into Bard grants us full Spellcaster spell slot progression, as well as Magical Secrets, which are two of any of the best spells in the game. Astarian on our Ranger added three levels of Champion Fighter onto his build from Act 2, which again is mostly just for Action Surge. And the Tempest Wizard finished taking the three remaining levels into Wizard, so that now it can learn spells like Chain Lightning and Globe of Invulnerability from Scrolls. For gearing, as was the case for the previous act, I'm only going to go over the changes in our gearing setup. There are a few, being that this is Act 3, so bear with me. Starting with the Sorlock, we switch to the Birthright sold at Sorcerer's Sundries in the Lower City for a plus 2 to our Charisma. 
both increasing our damage and accuracy with Eldritch Blast. For gloves, we have the Crater Flesh Gloves, sold by the Ballas Merchant upon becoming an Unholy Assassin. We're going to reduce our critical hit range just enough with the remainder of our gear that these end up being a significant amount of damage to our build. For weapons, we drop our shield in favor of both Rhapsody from Cazador and Bloodthirst from Orin. Rhapsody has this ability called Scarlet Remittance, which will add a plus one bonus to our attack rolls, damage, and spell slate DC up to three. The damage and attack roll bonus in particular is applied to each beam of Eldritch Blast, which will mean 12 additional damage per cast at maximum stacks. And the Bloodthirst will reduce our critical hit range to enable our gloves, as well as just a nice plus one bonus to our armor class. Finalizing our reduction of critical hit range, we have the Deadshot from Fitz Firecracker in the lower city that we just use as a stat stick. Our Bardadin ends up with Saravok's Horned Helmet, dropped by Saravok for crit reduction and CC immunity. The Ballas Armor, sold by the Ballas Merchant to radiate piercing vulnerability to enemies, doubling the damage that she deals with her daggers and that our Ranger deals with his arrows. This is a really critical piece to the synergy of this party, so I highly recommend rushing the Unholy Merchant as fast as possible upon reaching Act 3. The Legacy of the Masters sold by Damon in the Lower City for bonuses to our attack and damage rolls. The Amulet of Greater Health to give our only melee character just a bunch of health. Remember to respec this character after getting this amulet and dumping their constitution in favor of any other attribute as it'll bump up the constitution to 23 regardless of what it starts at. I also gave her the Killer Sweetheart in favor of the Crusher's Ring as I give everyone in my party the Astral Tadpole in Act 3 so movement speed becomes a non-factor. Her weapons will switch over to the Crimson Mischief from Orin and the Knife of the Undermountain King from the previous acts. The Gloomstalker also has some important changes in Act 3 namely the Horns of the Berserker, sold by Danthalon in Danthalon's Dancing Axe, the Armor of Agility, sold by Fitz Firecracker, but honestly, as crazy as it sounds, you can continue wearing the Graceful Cloth for the plus two to Dexterity. Just be warned that your armor class will be super low, not that it should matter too much. The Helldust Gloves, dropped by Harlop in the House of Hope for the 1d6 fire damage on weapon attacks, the Boots of Persistence, sold by Damon, Dual Wielding, the Dolor Amaris daggers, one of which is dropped by Dolor, the Red Dwarf, and the other of which is sold by the Ballas Merchant. Recall that the Assassin subclass guarantees critical hits on surprise enemies, so these daggers will deal 14 damage per shot on a surprise enemy. Finally, we have the Gaunter Mile Bow, dropped by the Steel Watch Titan in the Steel Watch Foundry. This might take a while to get, so you can use the Vicious Short Bow sold by the Ballas Merchant in its stead. And finally, to wrap up the video, I'll go over the Tempest Wizard's gear and quickly note on the synergies and abilities you should focus on come Act 3. To start, we have the Hood of the Weave, sold by Carrion the Necromancer, the Cloak of the Weave, sold by Helsick at Devil's Inn, and the Robe of the Weave, which you can get from the platform below Leroican. All of the Of the Weave gear pieces just add bonuses to our spell attack rolls and spell save DC, which is really important in maximizing our chances of our enemies failing the saving throw against our lightning abilities. For gloves, we have the Spellmike Gloves, which is a quest reward from Lucretius for finding Dribble's body parts, but which you can just pickpocket to save the trouble. Believe it or not, our accessories and ranged weapons remain the same, but our main hand changes to the most important item for this build, which is the Marco Heshkir staff found in the same platform below Leroican. Marco Heshkir will give you an ability called Kareska's Favor, which once per long rest will allow you to choose an element. We'll be choosing Bolts of Doom as this is a lightning build that will give you a free lightning bolt and chain lightning per short rest. And actually it'll give you another free lightning bolt or chain lightning per long rest by virtue of Arcane Battery, which will alleviate the spell slot cost of the next spell that you cast. So because of this one staff alone, we get to cast two free lightning bolts and three free chain lightnings per long rest, which is further increased to three free lightning bolts and four free chain lightnings because we have a bard in a party that gives us an additional short rest. Seven free casts of lightning abilities per long rest is insane. If you didn't know before, now you know. 